I just want to thank you all for coming in again. Um, and thanks also for the uh, ter terrifically generous donations we've been getting, um, which we're sharing, as you all know, uh, with the uh, 50-50 with Il Cuore di Firenze, the charity raising a lot of money to support the Florentine hospitals at this time. Um, next week, we've got, let me check what we've got next week. Next week, we've got Jeremy Boudreau back again. Uh, he's doing another of his uh, talks based on a p particular part of the city. Uh, this, this time he's looking at the San Giorgio uh, uh, area of Oltrano, where there's a lot of very interesting history and art which he's going to explore for us. Um, and the only other thing to mention, and I'll, at the end I'll put up a little bit more information, is that Jeremy is also launching a, um, a special online seminar series starting on May the 11th, uh, five sessions every day. Uh, going deep into some aspects of, of the Florentine arts. Um, so without further ado, I'll now introduce Helen Farrell, who's our speaker tonight. Helen is the editor-in-chief of the Florentine, which many of you will know is by far the best English language publication in Florence. Uh, it's been running, I think, for 30 years, just been your birthday. Uh, and Helen's been running it for a number of years, uh, and it's a, a, a really a good and interesting read each month, as well as a whole bunch of information um, and like many people, Florentine has been operating online for the last eight weeks during lockdown and have been doing a sterling job in um, keeping the community together and passing out a lot of very important information for the English speaking community here in Florence and the neighborhood. Um, so uh, Helen's going to speak to the title of that most recent publication. Um, so over to you, Helen. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, and thank you all for being here. This is an incredible honor for me as a Brit uh, to be speaking uh, at the, uh, the British Institute of Florence. Um, as Simon mentioned, uh, the Florentine's been around for 15 years, although it feels like 30, uh, the owners would say, or considerably longer. Um, we're a print magazine, so you know, it's, uh, normally we come out in print every month, um, but most of us know us, and, and this international audience that I'm seeing tonight probably know us more from our social media channels than from our website. Um, this evening, I'm gonna focus a little bit on what's been going on in Florence in the last eight weeks, <laughs> unbelievably, when we've been locked inside and unable to see this beautiful city that we all adore so greatly. Uh, it's an unusual experience, um, you know, I can testify to that insofar as my life in the last eight weeks has been a kaleidoscope. <laughs> it's been a roller coaster, it's, it's been up and down, it's been difficult to follow the news, uh, difficult to react quickly and accurately to sources of information which vary from one second to the next. Not even the Italian journalists can get their head around it most of the time. Uh, so, uh, uh, figurati as we say, imagine trying to do it in an international capacity, but that's what we've been trying to do. Healing Not Broken, uh, the title that I'm talking under this evening, um, is a commemorative issue, which is kind of strange to talk about a commemorative edition of a magazine when you're still actually in the midst of, uh, of what you're commemorating. Um, the idea of, of this publication was to bring together a chorus of voices, a chorus of strong, devoted, loyal voices to the city of Florence to talk about what, would, what we were going through and what may or may not happen next. Um, so that's the cover there. If you've not already seen it, it's available as a free download and it's also now available as a book, but I'll talk about that later. Um, so, I mean, I, like many people on around the, the end of February, was very dubious about the situation. You know, I was like, oh, nothing's, nothing's going to happen. This can't possibly become a pandemic and everything else. And then here's a photo of our editorial team promoting our March issue, which quickly actually became out of, out of sync with, with the entire reality of, of, of what came next. Uh, we published a, an edition to celebrate food because every March in, in, uh, in Florence we have Taste, which is an incredible uh, showcase of, of food and wine from across Italy. Uh, and we put Dante on the cover because uh, 
the 25th of, of March, if I'm not mistaken, was, was uh, Dante Day, and I'll get to that soon. So that was, that was what happened on the, the 29th of March. Um, we, we were still following regulations that said that, you know, nothing, we just had to wash our hands and cover our mouth whenever we sneezed and nobody believed what, what on earth would, would come next. But there's Dante for you with a, with a quote that now resonates when you think about it. Ti lascere ogni cosa diletta più caramente. You shall leave everything you love most. Although that's not entirely true because we're still here and Florence is still very much alive uh, behind its doors. What then transpired over the next few days, and I think this is when the, the tide started to turn in Florence, um, we, we published on the 29th of uh, February uh, a fantastic article uh, by, and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing the name, by Lisa uh, Cabaraicha, uh, which spoke about the departure of the 25,000, I think it was 25,000 study abroad students from Florence who were summoned back to the States uh, uh, on the notion of um, uh, there was a, a change in uh, in legislation. A warning was put out from uh, from the CDC uh, in the states, and so we lost. Florence lost its its study its study abroad program, and at that, that time, I think we all thought it was an overreaction. Certainly, Lisa's article, which is expertly written, it was a brilliant read. It was a very balanced piece. Uh, she spoke to Matteo Duni, the president of the Association of Scholars at American Universities in Italy. Um, it, the, the tone was, you know, what's going on? This is surely uh, not going to not going to get out of control. That week, things happened very quickly. If I hadn't published that article on the 29th of February. Uh, the, the very next day, uh, it, it would have been uh, untimely to have published it. Um, I think we were all quite shocked at what happened. Um, that's, that Sunday or that Saturday, I was in Florence and I went shopping with my husband. We wandered around the city. We had a lovely pasta lunch at uh, Il Porcellino. Uh, and um, it was very quiet. It was incredibly quiet. And then we have these, these images that came out, and uh, I don't know if any of you followers on Instagram, but we're very visual in our approach. And uh, as you can see here, the gloomy city streets and a very odd sunset that occurred. I don't know if there was any pathetic fallacy going on there, but it was a, a very odd situation. Um, but at that time, there was still hope that the culture scene would be fine. Um, we were told that uh, the civic museums would open for free between the 6th, on the weekend of the 6th and 8th of, of March. And of course, that rapidly did not occur. Um, what came next? On the March, March the 8th, uh, we were told that all of Italy's museums, libraries, cinemas, theatres, pubs would close, as well as the, all social and cultural events at that time until April uh, the 3rd. I also had my 40th birthday planned downstairs at the British Institute and that, and that got cancelled as well obviously because we were told that social distancing was was a, a necessary uh, requirement and uh, and and so uh, you know that, that went as well um, at that time we also made the decision on the on the 8th of March that we would close our newspaper offices in Beardy Banky and uh, and we've been at home ever since even though uh, we could actually go into the offices. We decided to to protect our staff. And then, of course, came that decision out of the blue. I think we'll never forget it for as long as we live. When uh, the, the Italian Prime Minister declared the Zona Protetta, a nationwide quarantine zone. And, uh, and life changed right then. So there were no more family dinners, no more hanging out in the piazza. This excerpt here is from one of our newsletters. Um, and uh, there was a line in there that I, you, I received emails from all over the world to the tomorrow we will repair, uh, today we will protect. So that's, that's what happened on March the 9th. We then decided that we had to somehow capture the moment. And this is a moral struggle for any editor. 
you know that you have to still carry on giving the news. You know that you have to show the city. But how do you put people at risk? How do you ask a photographer to go out there and, and capture the city? What actually happened was Francesco Spighi, whose photos I think you've probably all seen now, just for the mesmerizing beauty and, uh, and this tragedy, although Florence is still so poignant and so beautiful and so dignified. Uh, in, in the moment of this panda pandemic. Francesco Spighi was actually out and about before the quarantine. He was photographing uh, for his clients as a professional wedding photographer. And, uh, and we got in touch with him and said, Francesco, would you mind going out and photographing for us because you're already out there? Uh, we gave him a letter. He got the approval from the authorities and he's been out there rapidly taking photos on his bike around the city. And this is the thing I think that people don't realize is that Francesco has been incredibly respectful of the rules. These photos are taken at incredible speed around the city. He doesn't hang around. He portrays it and he goes home to his family. And he's done incredible photos of his family as well, which is, is quite amazing. So these are photos taken on March the 13th. Uh, March the 14th um, was when we, we had this outpouring of of love and solidarity. It was, it was quite incredible. I think we all shed a few tears on, on the 14th of March. Um, we had the moments where uh, we were on the 14th, oh, sorry, on the 13th of March at 6 p.m. We all took to our balconies and terraces, and we all made a hell of a lot of noise. We were banging pans and, uh, and, and showing that we were all there for one another. On the 14th, we started to hang the rainbow banners painted by children up and down the country. And that's become almost a symbol around the world for this pandemic. I mean, my, my family in the UK mentioned to me, this, what's this? An, andra tutto bene, andra tutto bene. Everything will be okay, it will be all right. And uh, I think that we will never forget this photo that came out from, uh, from, from the city of Florence. The strength of the David. Uh, this city has been through so much in the past. It's been through conspiracies, it's been through floods, it's, it's, it's had the plague. It will get through this too. We just have to hang strong. And that's what that, that image had to say there. That paired with the illustration by our graphic designer, uh, Leo Cardini, of, of us all making a lot of noise, using music to communicate with one another. We also had on the same evening as the rainbow banners, we had the, the medics, we were applauding the medics. And of course, that's now something that has gone around the world too. the NHS uh, in the UK, everybody's doing on a regular basis. So this was the show of solidarity that we had on March the 14th. I sort of go forward a little bit here because Florence, we're not out on the streets. We can't go to the museums, not yet, hopefully on the 18th. Uh, the museums and the exhibitions will reopen. But what we have seen um, for the first time in a very long time, I would say, this outpouring of virtual culture, the way in which the exhibition places and the galleries have really got their act together to stay in touch with the world. So Palazzo Strozzi, which has an incredible exhibition, or had, <laughs> still has an incredible exhibition on uh, by an Argentinian artist. They've, they've been using their, their contacts with artists around the world to have conversations on social media. Um, we've also seen uh, Florence's civic museums using digital tools to reveal the secrets of the Palazzo Vecchio, the Museo Novecento, the Morate, uh, the Badini Museum, Santa Maria La Vella. The uh, Opera House, uh, the beautiful modern opera house, the Maggio Musical Fiorentino has been streaming opera, uh, reruns of incredible performances of uh, a very high calibre uh, in the past. Museo Galileo has got its act together and they've been showing us uh, the various scientific innovations that have occurred over the centuries. Uh, today, uh, the Uffizi, who have been uh, absolutely exceptional, uh, showing us exhibitions and, and everything else. Um, they have actually launched on TikTok, which is probably the hardest social media platform uh, for culture to operate on. And it's absolutely hilarious. I would recommend 
if you have TikToks, to take a look at how the Uffizi are innovating with culture right now and they are reaching uh, the next generation. So there's opportunity there uh, to, to reach new publics with culture that maybe wasn't there before. Uh, March the 25th, going back to Dante, uh, it was Dante Day. Uh, they decided this, the authorities, uh, last year that they were going to make March the 25th uh, all about Dante. Uh, and so we uh, put out a newsletter that was all about Dante and uh, it was an incredible reaction. That's when I think I, I realised um, that there was a thirst there uh, for something that didn't have anything to do with coronavirus. You know, there's so much more going on in terms of culture and, uh, and we gave out a lot of content about that. Of course, this quote uh, from Inferno uh, really does resonate right now. We also see an outpouring of community events, uh, including this wonderful uh, virtual cultural uh, series from the British Institute of Florence. Um, the Student Hotel uh, in Florence have been organizing all sorts of weird and wonderful events that have been community-based, uh, a lot about mental health as well, uh, and keeping us company, uh, all in English, which of course uh, our international community really does need. Um, the Florentine have launched TF Together and we've been having a tour de force this evening as uh, the director of the British Institute, Simon Gamble, uh, took us through a tour of, uh, of Queen Victoria's time in Italy and in Florence. She was a recurring visitor to the city. Uh, and so we've been seeing these moments of outpourings, which I think is just fantastic to see how the international community is alive as ever and being incredibly reactive and innovative in the circumstances. Um, March the 27th, I had a lovely conversation uh, with a woman who's a resident of Florence who decided that she wanted to do something for the city, for the medics. And so she wrote to the supermarket chain, uh, to Esselunga, and said, why can't we have priority lanes for healthcare workers? You know, they've been working all day at the hospital, they deserve uh, to be treated uh, better in terms of being able to get the supermarket shopping done and out and uh, I think this has a lot to say about the way in which we internationals react and, and know that we can make a difference in in Italy and that became she actually heard back from them incredibly quickly uh, Esselunga introduced those priority lines so did uh, Unicop Firenze uh, it, it was a nationwide reaction and then of course we saw that that took place in the UK as well and various other countries around the world. So uh, I think we can, that, that, uh, that uh, Welsh resident in particular can be incredibly proud of what she did there. Uh, March the 31st, I, I was obviously having a wobbly, but this photo of the mayor of Florence, Dario Nardella, lowering the flags um, of the city of Florence and, and then the, the Italian Tricolore, in the empty Piazza della Signoria, I will never forget this image uh, for the rest of my life. It's, we, how, how often have we seen Piazza Signoria empty like that? Um, so that was a, that was a minute's silence, uh, again, standing in solidarity with the medics and also putting out a message of hope around the world. Um, a quick word about the journalism that's happened um, on an international level in Italy uh, during this time, because people have really stepped up. There's been incredible journalism uh, put out by um, Jason Horowitz of the New York Times. Uh, I'm sure you've all read his articles. If you haven't, I would recommend that you go and read them. They're at an incredible level. Um, John Hooper of The Economist uh, with his correspondence diary. Um, Rebecca Winks, who talks about how being a single parent during a pandemic for Italy magazine. It's uh, an incredibly poignant read. And Barrett McGarrion in uh, World Literature to get Today. All of these reads I would recommend because it really does uh, show you the level um, of, of what people are writing about this situation. Because of course, that's what comes out of uh, you know, we have incredible creativity in the moment of the crisis. Which brings me to uh, April 9th. Um, April, uh, we decided that we had to put together something 
to remember what was going on. Um, healing not broken, uh, really, as I mentioned before, is a chorus of voices from across the community. Um, it's, it's something that I felt very strongly we needed to do. And I'm very, I'm very proud to have been you know, an editor in this situation. Um, I, I don't know if you've read it, but if you haven't, please do download it. Uh, it, it was an incredible experience to, to be able to edit something of, of this character. Uh, it, it shows in, uh, institutional um, uh, stories, uh, stories from across the community. We have children writing their piece about what they've, what they've seen and we have hopes for the future. I'll go back to that in, in a second. Um, the April the 14th is when we saw our first glimmer of hope and more photos from Francesco um, as we saw the reopening of the bookshops. Now, this has been debated. Why reopen with the bookshops? I mean, there's, we could talk a lot around that point. Um, I personally saw it as a, a starting over from culture. Uh, it's, it's a way to express how Italy's essence lies in, in creative production. So we, we saw the reopening of, of certain bookshops. Others chose not to. Uh, but it was a glimmer of hope and uh, these photos I think show this interim situation, this sort of new normal with which we will have to reconcile. Also loving uh, Ostilani, the historic uh, stationery shop there, reopening again. On the 20th of April, um, forgive the tongue-in-cheek illustration, uh, we were trying to joke around but uh, I know some people loved it. Some people uh, wanted us to start reposting photos of, of artworks without masks, rightly so, uh, from the Uffizi. But we, here we have the birth of Venus playing her part and leading the way with, as a masked masterpiece. So on the 20th of, of April, um, we were told that we had to wear masks, uh, face protection, um, and, and the Tuscany region has really stepped up um, we have had masks, face protection delivered to all of our doors as residents. And even if you're not a resident, um, you could get in touch with the authorities, the civil protection, and they brought uh, two, move, two face masks to our doors. Also, um, they are distributed uh, for free uh, in all pharmacies uh, and supermarkets or check your local pharmacy. I'm not sure it's every pharmacy, but it's certainly one in for every comune. Uh, you, you can buy uh, packs of, of masks and they are being distributed all the time. So um, that's, this is around April 20th when we started to see how the authorities were handling this crisis. Um, the city of Florence um, has provided, uh, has gone the extra mile, uh, I believe, uh, in terms of offering support, financial support for rent. Yes, it doesn't cover it all, but it's a helping hand. Um, they've even provided psychological uh, support. There's a phone line uh, that you can phone up and if, if you need help uh, from, with mental health, then they're, they're there. They've even, if you're in a mandatory quarantine, uh, they give you help with looking after your pets, they've been looking after your dogs or whatever. So. Um, you know, we're seeing, I think, a sort of a return to humanism uh, in Florence. You know, maybe we got a little bit lost. Maybe we got a little bit greedy with tourism. And, uh, and now uh, there is this sort of return to putting people first in Florence and the residents in particular. So what does the future hold? I mean, this is a very difficult question to, to answer, obviously. I can only say on the basis of what I'm seeing, um, and that's an incredible level of creativity already. On May the 4th, we'll be able to go outside again and walk. On May the 18th, it's scheduled that the museums, the galleries, the exhibitions, the libraries uh, will be able to reopen if they deem fit. On the 1st of June, they're talking about restaurants um, being able to open their doors again. Uh, today, we saw a demonstration from uh, 
1,500 restaurants across uh, Florence and the, the outlying areas of Florence, handing their keys over to the Palazzo Vecchio as if to say, well, we're done. And the mayor uh, said, no, you're not done. I'm gonna give you use of all public space, piazzas and streets so that you can do your social distancing outside. Uh, you will be able to, to greet your, uh, your diners in that way. And um, we're seeing a solidarity. The restaurateurs are actually very grateful towards the authorities for this gesture. Um, we will see what happens next. The outpouring of creativity that I've seen from, from producing Healing Not Broken and also our May issue, which will be out on the 7th of May with a very short print run, but it will be out. Um, the creativity is still there. You know, artists are still painting, they're still sculpting. The creative people in Florence Group are looking to the future. It's grim, it will be difficult, but they're finding ways of moving forward. Um, the authorities are working together. Uh, as far as tourism goes today, there was um, a debate uh, with all the leading uh, tourism board, uh, local councils, um, I'm talking on a regional basis here, um, then the title of the talk was from over tourism to under tourism. They're aware that there's a problem on a national level. Uh, they are looking to create tax, tax breaks and grants so that you spend the money locally. And that's where things will begin. Domestic tourism, of course, will be first as soon as it's, since we're allowed out of our homes and allowed to go and experience the wonderful uh, countryside of Tuscany and the coastline. Um, so we'll start with domestic then go European and hopefully international. But you know, in, in, in the meantime, we'll be staying close to our homes. Um, but there are definitely ideas for the future. Um, also today, there was um, a number of grants that were put out uh, by the Tuscany region um, to, for innovation in the manufacturing field. Um, I'm trying to find the, the amount of money. I can't find it right now, but it was a substantial pot of money uh, aimed at small, medium and large companies uh, in the field of innovation to bring uh, Tuscany's uh, companies up to a competitive level. Um, I think we'll see a greener future in Florence. This is already something that the uh, city of Florence was working towards. Um, they've been talking about adding new cycle paths. Uh, in the next month or so, we'll be seeing uh, electric bikes reintroduced to the streets. Uh, we'll be seeing scooters, kick scooters and electric ones introduced. Um, they're going to be planting uh, more trees in the next few years to, to reduce uh, air pollution. Um, I think this is the, the step that the city was already taking. I mean, we've, we had Stefano Mancuso's incredible air factory design, Manufattura Tabacchi, uh, looking towards clean air in the future. Um, I can certainly say that in the last 12 months, um, we've been working together with the Tuscan uh, Tourism Board to promote uh, outdoor tourism. Uh, I mean, they even got me jumping out of a plane. I mean, it was quite incredible. Uh, but these sort of experiences, maybe we won't all be doing that. Uh, although may, maybe we're, we're in for a bit more of adventure after the last eight weeks, who knows? But uh, so this, there will be this move towards exploring the smaller, uh, slower areas of, of our region. Um, I've been exploring the, the spas up until uh, now. I went down to Saturnia. And these are places where, you know, they deserve our exploration. We will be leaving the cities maybe a little bit more uh, and exploring these areas. Um, I would like to close with uh, a piece um, that John Hooper from The Economist kindly wrote uh, for Healing Not Broken. I think it sort of sums up what maybe we will see in the future. So these are John's words. Since arriving in the city, I have often wondered what it would be like to experience uh, a Florence so silent. It has taken a microscopic virus and a modern plague to show me. Yesterday, I walked by the Arno, marveling at the clarity of the water and then crossed the Ponte Vecchio. It was early afternoon and I was the only person on the bridge. 
even in the 1920s, of course, at that time of day, the Ponte Vecchio and the whole of the rest of the center would have been throbbing with noisy life. You would need to go back to perhaps the eighth century or even earlier to experience a daytime Florence as quiet and still as that which some of us have experienced in this radiant, lethal Italian spring. But it will all soon be very different. This pandemic, like every pandemic, will abate. The students will return, the tourists too, though if the tide really does turn against globalization, as some are predicting, maybe not, quite, not, maybe not in quite such asphyxiating numbers as before. And there will always be people who will feel that they have not yet done justice to their lives until they have visited the Uffizi, the Academia, and the Pitti Palace. They will want to, to see the dramatic facade of the Duomo, and those who are engaged with the history of art will want to go inside to study, among other things, the frescoed equestrian portrait that Niccolò da Tolentino, of Niccolò da Tolentino that Andrea del Castagno painted in 1456. They will marvel at how the artist tricks the eye of the viewer and wonder perhaps what this great painter, then in his mid thirties, might not have achieved had he lived to the age of a Leonardo or a Michelangelo. For the following year, plague swept Florence and among its victims was Andrea del Castagno. As any good Florentine will tell you, there is nothing new under the sun. That's it. <laughs> if anybody has any questions or observations, I would actually love to hear from people how they feel Florence could improve in the future. I think we will all agree there were probably issues before. And, uh, and I would love to be able to use the Florentine to, to channel opinions from the international community back to, back to the, the Tuscany region and to the Comune. So I'm here. That's it. <laughs> Alan, thank you very much. That was a beautiful portrait in words and images of what's been, what it's been like and um, your thoughts about where it's going. Um, so thank you very much indeed. Um, if you would now get rid of your presentation, stop sharing your screen. Um, we that can then invite people to, to join the discussion. Same rules as always. If you want to say something, unmute yourself and say it, and then remember to mute yourself again afterwards so that we don't have complete bedlam. But you, you, you're a pretty good crowd on the whole. So who would like to make a point or ask Helen a question? Over to you guys. Can you hear me? Yes. So, Vanessa? Um, yes, hello. Um, I just wanted to ask your opinion on something. I have a Florentine mother, a very ancient lady, art historian, who is in a care home in Florence. I haven't, I'm in England, I'm in the UK. I just wondered, do you have any sense of when we'll be allowed to travel back to the city when tourists and people like me will be able to come back? I think right now it's very hard to say. I mean, the authorities are trying to save the summer, but I don't think it will be for international tourism. I think we, I don't think any time before next spring. The point is that I mean, we've never been through anything like this before, have we? I mean, this is the big challenge for our generation. It's not just about Italy. If Italy managed to get this under control because we were among the first country after China to see this happen, uh, I think Italy will try and close its borders to protect itself in the meantime. So it really does depend until we find a treatment or a vaccine. Um, I also think, uh, this is personal opinion obviously, but I don't know whether we'll be, the tourism will change as well. I mean, in terms of flights, Let's talk about this whole middle seat removal and, and everything else, but I think it will be exceptionally difficult to fly as well. I mean, there are still flights in and out of the country. There are, um, but I, only time will tell. It's a difficult one to call, isn't it, unfortunately? So I have a question. This is, hi, this is Jennifer. Um, hi, Jennifer. Hi, Helen, it was great to talk, thank you. Um, 
we're going to be allowed uh, soon, next week, to travel within our region, which is Tuscany. There's no indication of inter-regional travel as yet, right? So um, how are they going to control um, uh, keeping people, Tuscans in Tuscany and non-Tuscans from not coming into Tuscany? Um, this is going to be, even though we'll be allowed out of our doors <laughs> on the 4th of May, um, as far as I am aware, based on the legislation that currently exists, um, we will be required to take our self-certification with us, even within, even as, just when we leave our doors. We'll still be required to carry that with us, I think, until at least the 18th of May. I think all this is going to become very clear once the government produces, or not very clear, slightly clearer, once the government produces its frequently asked questions, which, you know, if you think about it, Jennifer, I mean, when they closed us in our homes, when we were shut up, um, it was very unclear for, for a long time. It's going to be even more complicated to reopen the country. I mean, in terms of legislating this, it, it's, it's a bit of a nightmare, really, isn't it? Yeah. But as far as I'm aware, we have to stay within our regions for the foreseeable future. Yeah. But... Yeah. But to be honest, um, because I've actually been stopped by the police two miles from our house out, out in Tuscany. Um, and then, you know, that was at 12.45 p.m., just before lunch. When I came back at 1.30, there was nobody there because they'd gone off for lunch. It's not like somebody hopped in, you know, they, they, they had another ship that took over. So, um, sorry, I'm sounding paranoid, but we've lived so... Um, isolated mm. uh, with, with such safe distance from other people that I fear that um, they, they're, they're, that's why I'm asking that there isn't going to be sufficient control um, to make going out uh, to, to make to feel safe about going out. It's personal responsibility. This whole thing is about personal yeah. responsibility, right? I mean, have we all learnt this now? Because they tried to allow us to have the liberty to go for a walk still. They did try that and it didn't work. So, I mean, my hope is that in two months, given the severity of the situation and the bombarding of the message, hopefully we, we will have learned common sense if we didn't have it before. I mean, it's based on us. They can only legislate and control us to a certain degree, but they can't go any further than that. It's based on us and our behavior. Yeah. So right. Yeah. So. Other thoughts? Other comments? Oh, um, hi. Thank you very much for your beautiful talk. Um, hi, Alison. Hi. 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 Um, you had talked about they, they, they've gotten together today and they're issuing grants and whatnot. Do they, have they, do they have any contingencies for the artisans, for artists? I mean, they, they were very were suffering before this whole pandemic. And um, are there any contingencies for them? I mean, there, there is, if you have um, a patita eva, if you are a registered business, uh, in the financial law for March, I think it was, there was the 600 euros that you could apply for. And what they're doing is um, you will be able to click and renew that. And I think they're planning on giving 800 euros for the next month. So if you are a registered Italian business owner and artisans, of course, I, I assume are included within that category, then there is that pot of money there. Right. Um, I mean, other places that, that I would suggest, um, there are certain charities in Florence that really do uh, try to look after uh, the, the heritage that we have in this city. Fondazione Cia di Firenze. Mm -hmm. um, for example, are, are, are doing incredible things, really incredible. They regularly publish uh, calls for grants on their website. So I would recommend going and, and looking up there. I actually wrote before, uh, before starting this talk this evening, I wrote to uh, creative people in Florence and asked what we could do to help. Mm -hmm. in terms right. of giving a showcase to maybe doing a creative special issue um you know to to use the florentine to reach our international readers and, and to give you a hand with that i mean these are the things that 
that have come to mind right now. Um, I'm sure that other things will will happen. The city of Florence has been incredibly receptive as well. So I mean, it might be worth uh, creating people in Florence as a, both a Florentine, you know, because it's international but local at the same yeah, time. Great. It might even be worth reaching out uh, to the authorities and seeing what they have planned to to give us a hand as well. Right. Thank you. Could I ask a question? Um, Helen, do you think that there's going to be any pulling back and re-putting us back in our homes if people don't adhere to some of these limited um, freedoms that we have uh, and take advantage of them? Um, I know that we're supposed to wear masks and I wear mine whenever I leave the house, but I see so many people with them hanging on their ear, on their neck, underneath their mouth maybe over their mouth but not over their nose um yeah i i, 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 I just really worry that uh if the numbers go up we're all going to be locked down again yeah i mean there, there there's cause for concern susan uh -huh. there is and um this is actually something that i've asked i've commissioned a, a graphic designer to come up with a how to wear your mask and how not to wear your mask and then i want to go to the authorities and say you might want to consider You've given us the masks, but you also need to educate us how to wear them. So there's that side of things. In terms of putting us back inside again, um, I mean, the, the Italian Prime Minister has been going around doing press conferences, I don't know if you've seen, but he, he's very much, there is going to be a system. So the reason why we're not being all allowed out on the 4th of May is they need to test that the system works. There are certain areas of the country where the contagion, num contagion numbers, are, infection numbers are still up. Uh, the rate is going down everywhere, but not all at the same rhythm, obviously. So what they're planning on doing in this 15 days from, from the 4th of May to the 18th, or you know, in that period of time, is they're testing. Every region will have to give a daily report on their infection rate to the central government. And if they're seeing that there's an increase, then they will, as he says, uh, President Conte, close the tap. So the idea is that, that, that we will not, as an entire country, have to shut down all of it, that it will be far more controlled. So that's the philosophy that they're going for. Any more thoughts or questions, Keith? Jennifer? Um, hello, Helen. Thank you very much for an excellent talk. Uh, I, um, I, I was taking up your comments about um, tourism in the future and how tourism is going to change. And it, it made me recall um, contemporary Italian friends who always talk with nostalgia about those days, the 60s and the 70s, when every piazza in Florence was the sitting room of the city. And tourism for them has meant the, the death of all that. And I, I just wonder, especially in these early post-lockdown days, if Florentines won't find themselves going back to that lovely situation where the city actually belongs to them and they, they feel that they're out in their, in their piazzas with just, with just other Fiorentinos. And I think that they, it's a very exciting time. It's, and your comments about tourism changing about um, about the government, uh, the Commune opening up and allowing the piazzas to be taken over by the restaurants so social distancing can, there's definitely change, all this is going to change and I look forward to the Florentine checking that mm -hmm. and, um, and perhaps helping it along so that Florence becomes as it was, um, a beautiful place for Florentines as as well as as well as everyone else and i think i think we all have to those of us who are in exile at the moment we have to wait to be invited back and yeah and i i would really agree. Lovely. yeah i i would agree with you entirely um i for one cannot wait for sort of the end of may the idea of being able to explore florence with hardly anybody around i mean it's a very odd situation i never ex um, I was born in 1980, I'll be honest. I mean, I never experienced Florence like that. I've never seen it like that. 
I mean, the, the closest I've come, I'm very lucky as a journalist, you know, I've had those opportunities of being in the Uffizi on a Monday with nobody in there and being with the David, just, you know, gazing at him. I think that's, that will be amazing for those of us who are here, that we will have that time to lovingly be quietly with Florence. You know, I think that will be something that none of us will ever forget. But I mean, that's just optimism in many ways. But, you know, it will be an interesting time to see how we negotiate this, how the Florentines, you know, re-embrace their city uh, and, and how in the future we deal with tourism. You know, I, I think it will start, once we go international, I think it will be the very, very high end tourism that comes back first, probably. Um, and, then, and then we see what I think Airbnb, or, you know, bye-bye, perhaps. You know, hopefully, you know, rent will go right down for us. We'll, you know, people will be able to find accommodation again as residents. Um, so it will be an interesting future. You know, that's for sure. I wonder how long, you know, from we will have until this gets resolved. How quickly will they'll come up with that vaccine and, and, and then, you know, we'll be inundated again. But that's the beauty of Florence as well. More thoughts? I have, a, I have a tiny, sorry, I don't want to talk too much, obviously, <laughs> but I do. But somebody, and I don't know where I got this from, said, because I find the, the masks really claustrophobic, um, is that if you spray your perfume or scented oil drops before you put it on, it actually makes it much more bearable, given that we're going to be wearing masks for a long time and in the heat. So, uh, Yeah, I, I read as well, apparently surgeons, uh, they, they, uh, they sort of soak their glasses in soap and water and apparently that works for half an hour so they, they can, can complete some surgical operations <laughs> and procedures before it starts misting up again but there are this is another interesting thing though um the businesses that are converting you know that you're seeing this up and down the country in italy and now in other countries as well in Ferragamo has put part of its uh, production into making uh, face protection and um, protective personal equipment uh, there's a guy who owns a winery up near, near, up near me in Ponte Sierra, his, his family own a, a shirt making company in, in San Sepulcro. And uh, he kindly sent me these beautiful cotton face masks, you know, that are incredibly light and easy to wear, but are effective as well. So uh, it'll be interesting to see. I'm sure there'll be a lot of creativity uh, on the uh, face protection front. You know, people will be coming up with all sorts of ideas and it'll become almost weirdly trendy. So we'll see what happens there. Mm. Okay, um, Helen, there's no more questions. Helen, I don't have yeah. a question, but I just have a comment, and that is how grateful I am to you for all of the work that you've been doing for us in Florence and everyone around the world, uh, keeping us informed and keeping us hopeful for better times. Uh, I live in the center. I haven't stepped on, you know, grass in eight weeks. I haven't been able to do anything like that. So um, seeing the photographs of your team and what you've put into the online issue, issues has been absolutely crucial for us in terms of getting through this. So thank you for everything that you're doing for us and everyone else. Thank you, Jeremy. It's, but um, I always say this, the Florentine is, yes, I mean, we're a very small editorial team and we do it with great passion and uh, enthusiasm, but it really is all about you guys. It always has been. It was born as a grassroots publication for the international community in Florence. Yes, it's grown, you know, when uh, we're on social media and people read us all over the world, but it really is always all about you. Um, so the articles, you know, if anybody out there has articles, ideas, uh, things that they would like to see, uh, to either you know send our way and we produce it or you write for us then that's why we're here so please do reach out and uh, and all together we'll uh, we'll keep this conversation going and and stay in touch with Florence every which way we can I think that's a great way to end it all and I second Jeremy's tribute to Helen you and your team's work um, you've been you really stepped up along with other uh, English-speaking communicators in town, such as our friend Georgette, 
as to really helping to keep the community informed and, and together. So thanks for that. Um, and as I say goodbye to you all, I'm just going to remind you all, please, um, to keep the donations coming because it's really helping. We can give money to Il Cura di Firenze. It's helping to us, the British Institute, to stay alive at a very, very challenging time for us. Um, uh, on which note, I'll also just leave you with a, um, a little poster which I'll put on the screen now for uh, Jeremy's upcoming set of uh, seminars on art history, which start on the 11th of May. So I'll see you all next week. If you're not already getting our weekly What's On message, just drop us a line at uh, director at britishinstitute.it and we'll put you on the list. Okay, bye everybody. It's locked down. Okay, folks, thank you very much. Have a good time. <laughs>